This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek show number 524, recorded on February 17th, 2022. Here on Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home news reviews. Product updates and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studio. Here in a chilly, although Christian, it seems like our weather. I, you're, you, you get similar weather to us, but it's getting warm, gets cold, gets warm, gets cold. I think we're kind of in this roller coaster spring. Are you? Do you care about? I mean, are you? Does it matter if it's hot, cold? Like, do you pay attention to the weather at all? <sighs> I, I guess, uh, but not to the point where it, I don't know, um, grew up in cold, yeah. migrated to warmish, um, seasons are seasons. And, uh, yeah, see, I don't I've, think you care. I, that, if, it, it disappoints me. Yeah. I mean, if anything, <laughs> I've, I've become more of a, uh, a, a warm, warm blood south of the Mason Dixon line kind yeah. of, uh, yeah. season personality since, uh, yeah. not having Buffalo winners, but right. That's, that's it. true. That's true. Yeah, you did grow up in Buffalo, which puts a whole nother spin on cold weather, right? Yep. So, oh yeah. So, um, well, I this is the first winter I'm kind of like, I'm t- I'm done with winters. Like, I don't know. I don't know. What it, it was is. a cold one. I'll okay. give you that. It was a pretty cold one. Uh, maybe um, it's just the pandemic. I don't know. I just have like, I'm, there's so many things I'm done with right now. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm done. I am done that. Well, what we haven't done yet is uh, post some show notes. We'll do that out at theaverageguy.tv. Don't forget, join me on Saturday. So this Saturday at noon central, we'll, uh, we'll premiere this on YouTube, a chance for you to come out and do it again with an audience. Uh, there's usually five or six or 10 of us that show up to that thing. And it's just good, a good opportunity to chat uh, just around the video. So if you want to come out and do that, we premiere at noon Saturdays, noon central on Saturdays, right there on YouTube. You can head out to theaverageguy.tv slash YouTube for that. No show next week, which is the 24th of February. I It's my anniversary. And I was like, eh, probably shouldn't do one. We had scheduled the Discord chat for that. We're doing those the last Thursday of every month. That will move to the 3rd. So the 3rd of March, I think Marv, uh, Marv B is going to join us for that. So post-show, we'll move into Discord on that one, March 3rd. And then a big thanks to Gavin Campbell, who joined us uh, last week, did a bang-up job. We had a lot of great conversations with Gavin around uh, home security and home security cams. And Gavin, thanks for coming on to do it. Uh, We also recorded a Cyber Frontiers last night. So if you're listening to this, maybe you're new to Home Gadget Geeks, and you're like, what's Cyber Frontiers? Christian, you you were the brainchild behind Cyber Frontiers. If you had a one-minute elevator pitch to like what we're doing on that and we and we're just bringing it back although it's yeah. never been very consistent but no, uh, uh, give me the I one mean, minute it really was inspired from the early days of home tech when there was christian's corner and that was just like this blob of information of people you know sometimes did or didn't know what to do with it and as uh, i went through university <laughs> Uh, the academic perspective kind of picked up of like, what are some of the cutting edge technologies and things that really haven't made their way into the average guy's uh, viewport, so to speak, but things that are coming, uh, trends in technology. Um, And so when we launched the podcast, it was really just a focus on things like cybersecurity, big data, and the technologies that were shaping it. Um, The podcast quickly evolved to start covering other topics in um, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, uh, enterprise networking. Um, and so it's been a really fun show to just kind of look at some of those things that impact the technology industry and enterprises at large. Um, and then in more recent shows, still trying to bring it back to the average guy, right? So it's kind of a bit of the theoretical, a bit of the cutting edge. You may or may not be experiencing it in your life yet from a day-to-day basis, but we try to connect it and bring it back to what it means for you. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's super fun. We're going to shoot for one a month. Um, Second or third Wednesdays uh, seem to be the right, uh, the right cadence on that. We'll be, I'll be posting them on Twitter at Jay Collison. If you want to follow me on Twitter, Um, just, you can join us live. You can re subscribe to the feed. If it's probably dropped off, it had been 
uh, I think 17 or 18 months uh, in between the last one we did. I think we did it October of 2020 was the last one we did. And we actually had been kind of consistent up until that point. And then just uh, 2021 happened and uh, we missed uh, most of the year. So get resubscribed. Cyber Frontiers, if you're new to Home Gadget Geeks, it's one you'll probably like. And to head out there and get that um, resubscribed. I think if you were to, for 65, which we recorded last night, Christian, if you were to give a quick kind of synopsis of uh, w- what's the high level of what we talked about last night, you think? Uh, last night, in part, was a, a fast forward of like 2020 or a rewind of 2021 in macro spec, uh, particularly kind of looking across security trends. Um, as well as workplace trends, right? So what, what did COVID really do from a hybrid environment and what, what technology levers are getting pushed um, up or down as a result of that? And then also talking a little bit about the, um, you know, our, our breaches and ransomware and these other attacks, are they happening more often, less often? What levels of sophistication are we seeing? Um, and then, you know, what are some of the technologies that, are trying to combat those things. And then we also talked about, um, you know, just where the, some of the standards are or aren't in solving these problems and how the industry at large could be doing a better job um, to address those things. Uh, But fundamentally we've made a lot of progress. There are still a lot of really scary stuff that happened in 21. Uh, We talked about things like solar winds and the colonial pipeline uh, attacks as, as examples, uh, both within that year. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's good. It's a good overview. Uh, we'll be releasing that a little bit later this weekend or early next week. Uh, if you, if you want to get that and then I think March 16th, I already have it in the calendar to record again. So we'll look forward to doing those, um, as well. We had you on, uh, to kind of catch up with you about a month ago and, uh, we had a couple subjects lined up. And home theater was one of them. We just didn't have time to cover it. So I said, hey, would you come back and uh, spend some time talking about the new home theater you're putting in? Um, you know, you recently purchased a home, had an opportunity, yeah, kind of have an opportunity to get things going from scratch. Not everybody chooses, you know, some people just have a living room and they put a TV in it, right? From that yeah. standpoint. But it's a great opportunity. Home theaters and I mean, the, the equipment to do a really good one is all available at the consumer level now and that used to be kind of a you had to hire a guy to come in and set some things up and the wiring was a little intimidating and the parts were from weird companies you'd never heard of before right it it just was a it was kind of it, it, it was kind of outside of the diy space and and certainly in the last probably in the last decade that's all those barriers have come down and now I think the average guy can pretty reasonably set up a pretty nice system, a home theater system, and, and, and kind of get it as big <laughs> or as plain, I guess, as, as they want. Christian, talk a little bit about just your early thoughts and what were you hoping to achieve uh, by kind of setting up your, your, your own kind of home theater systems? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Um you know, probably, um, back in 2017 or so I invested, um, well, televisions are, aren't necessarily an investment as we'll soon discover, (laughs) but I purchased, um, one of the Samsung, uh, KUMU 6500s. It was the curved 65 inch. It was, I thought it was the coolest thing since sliced bread at the time. It was Um, cool. It was cool by the way. It's still cool. Yeah. It's still cool, but yeah. Uh, it's a cool panel. Um, it was kind of like, if you wanted a standardized UHD 4K HDR experience and you didn't want to pay top dollar, this was a good mid-range option, right? So not low end, not high end, kind of like that mid to mid high end. And if you wanted an OLED at the time, you were paying a minimum $5,000 period at the 65 inch range, right? So like to go the next step up to OLED in 2017, just kind of wasn't quite there for me, right? So it was like, okay, like, let's give Samsung a, a try here. Um, and, you know, by and large, very satisfied with the television. Good, good visuals. Um, had the integrated soundbar with the wireless subwoofer. And, you know, at, at the time being in an apartment, it, you know, it, it totally fits the bill, right? Um, it feels larger when you're in an apartment space. You don't need as much sound projection when you're in a, a smaller space like that. So the soundbar works really good. So it was the right purchase for the right time for what I wanted to do. Um, you know, fast forward 
five years later and it's still great television. Um, you can still go watch anything you want on streaming services in 4K and it's it's going to get the job done. But I, I think the industry by and large, it's a somewhat settled fact now that you just can't beat an OLED from the perspective of um, dark lit pixels and individually lighting each pixel and having them fire color is just a uh, whole new world, right? So with an LED television, it's going gonna, it's gonna to backlight portions of the screen. When you're a sci-fi nerd like myself and there are galaxy scenes and dark spaces and planetary objects, like you're really going to see that in an LED. Um, and so I thought, hmm, like it could be an interesting time to do um, an OLED build. Now, I uh, was also inspired additionally by uh, my father who had done the gallery build of the LG OLED, right? So 2020... LG GX, where um, the panel is specifically designed where you have to cut out a segment of drywall. And the TV, you can think of it, gets kind of sucked right up against the wall with that special cutout, which is where the wall mount goes. And we're talking like paper thin between if you stick your head to the side of the wall and look at it. I mean, it just looks like it's a part of the wall. It's that slick um, with kind of an integrated 5.1 LG soundbar. And I was like, huh, that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, I, I get to my build and what is it that I'm really trying to accomplish? And the first thing was like, where do I want to put this thing? So some different areas of the house to consider what, where I ended up really wanted to doing, wanting to, to build it was, you know, downstairs in the basement where I could do some soundproofing. I could kind of get it the way I wanted it. I could have some extra tech and hardware in there. And it wasn't like I was going to be messing up the feng shui of, uh, living room decor. Right. So I wasn't going for that gallery finesse kind of look. I was really going for high quality entertainment. You feel like you're kind of walking into a, a, a private-ish movie theater experience at the home. Um, so those were kind of my parameters, right? Now, uh, you know, first practical challenge was just dealing with furniture dimensions and wall dimensions. And it was a little bit of a weird space for me to figure out. But um, the first decision I had to make was, well, do I want a television that's wall-mounted or do I want a television that's on a stand? Um, and pretty much every home theater snob will tell you you're an epic fail if you put it on a fireplace or something where you're craning your neck up. So like you really need to get the height of your panel, whether it's on a mount or whether it's on a stand, you have to get that right. Like it should be eye level. It should be a natural looking experience. There should be a it should be a easy viewport with no hassle. Um, second thing you got to kind of consider and think about is like, what are your distances of objects in relation to the wall and in relation to where you're sitting. So like, what's the ideal distance between your furniture, where you're sitting in the television? Um, what's the ideal distance that you need around your speaker system, et cetera. So that also kind of influenced into it. Um, and, and just like the, um, my, my frequent hardware discussions I've had about how to buy web server hosting technology on a budget, um, you always kind of buy four years back. Well, I don't necessarily recommend that with televisions. It's more like one year back. And the key is you want to buy right before next year's CES starts. So at the end of the calendar year in a current year, the t televisions start to go on a nice little sale. Then in CES and Q1, they announce the next hot panel that's going to come out for the summer. The prices go back up for the current year's panel. And then by next summer, next year, next model panel. Well, this year is particularly interesting because when you looked at the new thing that LG rolled out, yeah, it was cool. Yeah, it had some incremental updates. But I mean, really, we weren't talking anything that was like going to be a revolutionary change between the 2021 model and the 2022 model. So on top of that, when you look at the pricing aspects associated where you know, they're running a, in effect, a 20% off of what the original retail value of that television is. That's kind of like a good time to strike, right? So the first decision is just, you know, if I compare the, the sale price of uh, what was actually a 77 inch OLED 
to what I paid for my 65 inch curved LED five years ago, I paid about the same amount of money. And yet it was a larger screen using way newer technology in terms of OLED, um, much higher quality panel, much more accurate, full featured suite of the LG WebOS operating system being on there where you don't need all these different gizmos and gadgets to stream this or that. It's just kind of all there in one experience. Um, and that, that to me was a pretty good indicator that like, okay, like OLEDs are very much becoming more the mainstream. And not only are they becoming more mainstream, but you can pick the quality of the OLED panel against your budget. So, you know, the G1 or the G series LG is kind of the highest end you can go. It's the cream of the crop. It's for people who want to compromise about nothing. Then you can get the C1 panel, which is um, you want pretty much uh, all the same bells and whistles, but you don't need the like absolute highest end or highest bend uh, panel that LG makes, but it's pretty, pretty close, right? So that C1 and G1 are kind of the top tier ones. And if you want no frills and guaranteed highest end performance, you buy G1. If you want the like, you know, 98% top tier, you buy the C1 and you save a lot of money. And that's kind of the first tier. Then you can kind of work your way down to get, you know, on the much cheaper end where you start looking at A1 series OLEDs where you can spend like $1,000 instead of $3,000 and still get an OLED viewing experience starting at 55 inches, et cetera. Um, so dramatically changed. I mean, now if you look at, I want to buy a 65 inch LED flat screen television, you can go pick one up $400 at your local warehouse, BJ's, Costco, Sam's Club, whatever the flavor is in your area, right? So that just shows you how dramatically the um, financial aspect of the the view screen of a home theater has changed just in the five you know five years that I've thought about it for myself. Um, once you get that um, that kind of insight, you kind of come to the conclusion unless you just really don't care and you just want something that shows a thing and you, you buy the led on the cheap, you know, you're going to buy an OLED. So, um, if I had to, if I had to pick my poisons between OLED companies, you can't go wrong with LG period. You just can't. Um, there's going to be, uh, Sony and Bravia and a couple other manufacturers that also produce very high end OLED panels. Um, Hard for me to evaluate them one way or another because I haven't owned them, but I hear and I read good things. So, you know, that's all comparison shopping that you as the consumer can choose to do. But, you know, by and large, when in doubt, you're probably not going to go wrong buying an LG OLED panel. So that was the first insight. Um, second insight was, well, I think I want to do something more than a sound bar. Why? Sound bars are cool. They're easy to install. You put in the digital optical input output cable into your television. It just kind of works. It's integrated with your remote. It sounds way better than the tin can trash sound that comes in on a TV panel. Remember you buy TVs in modern day for viewing, not for listening. That's always rule number one. So, uh, but I wanted, you know, I wanted a next step up, right? I had been kind of attracted and interested in, again, a home theater angle which implies a little bit more than, hey, look at my 2.1 or my 5.1. You really start to think about, well, what are the standards or the encodings by which most of these movies and high-end you know, streaming, digital content, original series, et cetera, like w what's the spec? Um, and there's two main specs that are pretty much at the consumer level. Uh, one is Dolby which is just, as far as I'm concerned, the coolest thing since sliced bread in terms of digital standards. Um, you know, and they're everywhere. All the streaming platforms, Disney+, Plus, Netflix, Hulu, Apple TV+, Plus. I mean, you name uh, Prime Video, all support it out of the box. And pretty much all the new titles that are being produced by these streaming providers and uh, probably at least since 2020, 
it's just there on the content. Like if you're enabled for it and you're good to go and you're set up properly, um, you're just, you're on your way. Um, and so that is movie theater quality metadata that is pretty close to, I'm going to go buy a Blu-ray DVD for everything I want to watch and get that kind of lossless content locally at the home um, in the native encoding. And then the second one is, you know, IMAX enhanced, um, which is a little bit newer. Not all the streaming platforms do it consistently. You'll see it more in selective movie titles. Um, and that one's a little bit more of a setup. So uh, I won't speak to that one as much on this show because uh, to me, I was quickly won over as a Dolby fanboy. Um, there are two kind of standards that you care about with Dolby. One is Dolby Vision, which is basically their own um, spec for HDR or high dynamic range, so to speak. And the other is Dolby Atmos, which is an encoding that basically um, digitally maps sound objects in a, you can think of it as like a three dimensional sphere, so to speak. So, um, the you know the net summary of coming to the realization that all i wanted to do is watch all my content in dolby vision and dolby atmos really guided my purchase decision because it kind of narrows the field for what you're going to start looking at when that's the type of content you want to watch as your baseline so with an oled panel from lg in any year in any series you're gonna have no problem playing dolby vision uh, as a spec audio however fairly more thinking is involved. Um, there's a ton of different speakers. There's a ton of different configurations based on room size and what, what it is you want to do. Um, there are just a variety of um, different manufacturers, different price ranges. Um, and that doesn't even get into, well, how the heck do I hook that system up to kind of integrate and be seamless? So I'm going to kind of walk through um, how I piece those things together um, because it, it helps you think a little bit more practically about what it is that you want to do based on your viewing preferences and your goals, which is ultimately like, I'm not here to advocate for everyone go out and buy my build, but I'm sharing my foray into home theater as an example for how one might think about it if this is something you're interested mm -hmm. in doing. Yeah, I, I, I think it's good. I mean, I'm not going to do it. This is maybe one of those areas that I, you know, I, we just don't, I mean, one, I don't watch a lot of TV. I'm sitting in front of this rig most of the time. This is how I consume my TV. But I'm super interested in how you've come to the, how you've, and I think others that are listening are as well. Christian, a couple questions for me. If you're sure. listening live and you're in chat, you want to ask questions, throw them in the chat room um, as well. One is, and you kind of mentioned this a little bit, as you were kind of thinking through the spacing, the layout of where this TV actually goes. And, you know, in the old days, we put them on the floor and we watched them from a couch straight across. Yeah. Then there was this movement to put them above the fireplace. Like every home had them up and away. You know, you'd put some couches and you'd be leaning back. And I guess that works if you're in a lean back kind of position. But as you, I, even ours, we put ours, you know, I put some cabinets underneath ours and I put our TV almost all the way up to the ceiling, right? I put it up high and you end up sitting back and looking up. I don't know if that's my most favorite configuration, but as you thought about the configuration, what, for you, what's, what do you like? Do you like it a lower, more at eye level? Or did you, did you kind of think, no, it really kind of needs to be up higher on the wall. Talk a little bit about because a seventy-seven inch that covers yeah. a lot, that covers probably half the wall, right? Too as well from from top to bottom. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So you know the decision I came to was that based off of my particular room configuration and layout, the wall mount did I could have done it, but it didn't make as much sense. And the way I actually had to orient the television with the furniture. Um, the viewing distance between where I'm sitting and the panel ideally is eight, eight feet. Right. Yeah. And when I changed the orientation of the room, that 
all of a sudden caused this problem where I was going to be way further than eight feet. So it was, a, it was at that point, clear, crystal clear, I'm going to be putting it on a stand. Mm -hmm. Now from there, the calculus to me is fairly simple. You, you, you measure your furniture or you plan out the new furniture you're going to buy for the room. You measure the height from the floor to the base of the seat. And then you measure from the middle of the center seat to your television. And from there, you should be able to figure out, are you at the right viewing distance, which is typically seven to nine feet, depending on what you got. Um, and then two, um, for the average height person sitting on that uh, furniture at offset X from the ground, um, how tall are your eyes from your eyes to the floor? And if you can't find furniture that makes your line of sight straight on that television and kind of really centers you up with it, um, it's just not as enjoyable. You're either doing this, craning your neck up like lost in space, Larry, or you're kind of doing this like, you know, like I'm staring at my phone, both cause weird posture problems. Um, and, and it's just not enjoyable. Um, when you go to a home theater and you think about it, even if you're sitting in non-optimal areas for the, the, the theater, whether you're in the back left corner, bottom right corner, center, obviously everyone wants kind of like center a little bit back off the ha halfway point. But at the end of the day, you're looking straight on at the wall. You're not doing this or doing this at a home theater. So to me, neck posture is like a huge deal. Um, and you should be able to think about this in very practical terms. Now it may feel awkward. Like one of the things that's very unusual, especially if you do a wall mount is that if you're going to get like a 77 inch panel, you're going to end up mounting that on maybe a empty wall, much lower than what your brain intuitively thinks is right. So like if you're standing in the room, it's going to look like it's too low. Then when you sit down, it's going to be exactly where you want it. Now, people's temptation is to kind of center it with objects in the room or center it with top and bottom of the wall, but their reference point is off. They're thinking of it about some type of architectural thing, and that's not really what I care about in a home theater. What I care about in a home theater is that the viewing experience is as good as it can be, and that means you're talking about what gives your viewers the, the most amount of comfort. And, and also when you think about things like peripheral vision and where your eyes focus and how your eyes are going to move across the screen, screen as motion happens, like those natural body postures and positions all are fairly important. Um, so that's, that's how I think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good. No, it gets, it gets me thinking, uh, you know, uh, Gavin had jumped in earlier and it said, Hey, I want to stick around, but I, I, I'm going to listen, but he's thinking about buying a TV. I think, when you're thinking about that size, you got to do a little bit of that math. You know, we, yeah. in the, in the room we're in, it's a pretty narrow room and I have the TV on the narrow side. So the couch is pretty close. I mean, we're, we're talking maybe six feet. So that's kind of on the short end of it. Mm -hmm. And, and like I said, again, if I do it again, I would have moved that TV down. It's definitely a look up. Now, Sarah uses it 99, my wife, uses it 99% of the time. She doesn't really complain. So, you know, she's never said to me, you know, that TV seems kind of high, you know, so it, it's kind of passed that test from that standpoint. We just have a simple sound um, bar on it. Uh, Christian, Kenneth asked, are, are there boxed audio solutions for you? You say Dolby is the, you know, for you, right? That's kind of the minimum that you're going in for. Um, did you, are there boxed options for Dolby or is that got to, does the TV have to support that? Um, I, it, the word boxed there is throwing me a little bit, but you mm -hmm. know, for example, LG, if you buy their panel, you can buy their accompanying kind of soundbar five, one solution that will support Dolby digital surround sound and, and, uh, most likely Atmos as long as you have the, the add on modules. Um, but um and the tv a, supports it right it's it's yeah. gotta come from the tv first you can't take a non-dolby tv and C add dolby to it right C correct like you you might have 
uh, you know, it's they're not mutually exclusive uh, things. So you could have Dolby Audio, but not Dolby Vision, or vice versa, or you could have both, or you could have none. So mm -hmm. your audio system needs to sp support a set of specifications. Your viewing screen needs to support a set of specifications. And ideally, you want both, but they're not necessarily, they're, they're not prerequisites of one another. Okay. Yeah, I think that's good. Okay, let's uh, let's keep going. Where do you want to go next? Yeah, so uh, audio was like this kind of big mystery for me at this point because all I'd ever done before was sound bars. Um, and so um, there's just a few like 101 things you got to think about when building out audio for home theater. The first is how are you going to power it? So people, you know, are used to sound bars where they plug a sound bar in the wall and that's that's all you ever think about right and then you plug in the digital optical cable to tv and you're done um well with speakers each speaker has speaker wire and that speaker wire goes to a power source um in addition to carrying basically the sound frequencies that are going to make that uh speaker um play the frequencies of of your audio so the first thing is like power sources, right? Um, there's kind of two schools of thought in this when you're building a home theater. One is you dedicated power each speaker through something called, well, through an amp, a dedicated amplifier. And then you use something called pre-outs uh, to basically amplify the speaker separately from the component that is sending data to the speakers. Um, and then there's the, how are you going to send your data to the speakers? And that typically, um, is performed as a function of your AVR or audio video receiver. Now, I feel like traditionally when you think about audio video receivers, people think, oh, that's like, if I have my Xbox and my Apple TV and my Nintendo switch and my PS2 and my TV and I all want to have like a unified remote where I can switch the video inputs easily, right? Yeah, that might be how you use it. But when you get into some of the higher end AVRs, they are this all in one capability of supporting the sound and the video um, and passing through the sound. So um, lots of things to think about uh, when first uh, deciding like, do I just want an AVR? Do I want an AVR and a dedicated amp? Um, I'll cut to the chase a little bit on that thread later, but the short story is I have yet to, to um, find a compelling argument for dedicated amp if you buy the correct AVR, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but you can't really think about any of this calculus until you know what speakers you want, because um, the power requirements for those systems are going to be totally determined by what speakers you end up going with. So, um, you know, here are the array of options, two speakers, 2.1 speakers, three, 3.1, five, 5.1, seven, 7.1. Uh, and then you get into these uh, amalgamations of the Atmos um, uh, front front firing, rear firing um, speakers. So you can get um, 5.1.2, which is your traditional 5.1 surround system with front facing up firing speakers for Dolby Atmos effects. You can do 5.1.4, which instead of two Dolby Atmos modules, you have four of them. Um, and you can also do, you know, 7.1.2, 7.1.4, etc. Well, the point is, if you want to do all that, that's all well and good, but you better you know, understand what the speakers are in that configuration. You have to understand what the power, the maximum power requirements are for each speaker. And uh, if you remember back in high school physics, you would have learned about something called Ohm's law, which is the amount of resistance going over that speaker cable and the amount of power associated. Um, and like, you're going to need to understand a simple metric, which is what is the maximum power at what resistance level is this speaker system designed for? And once you know that answer, now you can start shopping for an AVR, but it's not even worth looking at kind of the AVR and how do I go from speakers to video until um, you understand what kind of speaker system you want. Now, part of the way you can think about that practically is, well, 
what's the size of my room? Is my room carpeted? Does it have hardwood? Um, are there going to be a lot of uh, sounds bouncing off walls? Is there going to be sound deadening? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into just what kind of sound output are you going to want based off of what those room characteristics and acoustics are. Once you've thought about that for a little bit, you can pick the sized home theater speaker system that you need. Now, if you want to do Dolby Atmos, the bare, you know, you're really down to two options. You're thinking about either 5.1.2, 5.1.4, or the equivalents for 7.1 um, systems. So uh, for me, bit of a smaller room, didn't need the extra rear surround speakers. So for me, if I want to do Atmos and get that full theater experience, 5.1.2 is what I'm looking at. So, okay, I got to power five speakers, two up, up firing modules and a subwoofer. Now subwoofers um, pretty much universally are on their own independent power source. So you're really just looking at what is the power requirement I need for uh, the speaker system um, and the speakers themselves. And then only then do you talk about AVR. Now, someone might ask, well, I'm looking at all these different sound systems and uh, there's 50 million of them, just like there's a ton of televisions and I don't know what to do. Can you recommend one for me? Uh, sure, I can recommend one for you. Might be good, might not be good for what you want to do, uh, but it's hard to go wrong with these, I will say, especially if you're an intro to home theater enthusiast, you will not be disappointed by this. Um, even the, the great audio files out there in, in associated communities um, have a lot to say about these speakers. They were developed by uh, a German engineer who used to work for one of the, the top end um, home theater audio companies. And he kind of um, designed a brand and a product line called Eloc. Uh, as the company. And then Eloc debut was his first attempt at this in 2018. They got a lot right. Price was great. Value was great. Then they came out with Eloc debut 2.0. Totally off the charts. People went bonkers. They've been on the shelves for three years now. People just can't get enough of them. You type that into Google and uh, you'll be hard pressed to find kind of one hard thing about it. Like you just can't go wrong. And then even within that, you have options. So you can get their five series, which is a smaller chassis of the speaker uh, chamber, or you can get their six series, which is a bit of a larger speaker. Um, but either one will, will suit you well. Um, and then on top of that, you know, here we go back about strategic shopping. So this was a end of year kind of after Christmas, but before New Year's where those prices kind of dropped for a week and got them at like 25% off, decided to go with the, the larger six series, which is, and they come in different types of like um, architectural configurations, meaning like floor standing versus in-wall mounts, et cetera. So I ended up with two floor standing speakers for left and right, a large six, six uh, series center speaker, the two rear speakers, um, and then the two up firing speakers. Now, the cool thing about the sound system, in addition to just sounding brilliant and having rave reviews, um, is that um, originally with Dolby Atmos, you basically installed the speakers in the ceiling and it projected down over you. With the ELOC system, this is an example of the sound bounces up to the ceiling and then drops back down where you're sitting. So it's it's a it's a reverberation effect, so to speak. Um, and this is unlike televisions, which really like you're irrelevant after a few years in terms of how the technology has been progressing. You invest in a good speaker system, and it's a uh, it's going to last you as long as you want it to really, I mean, you can get 20 plus years out of these speaker systems and be really just tickled pink with, with how they sound their performance. You're going to hear things and in, in tracks that you're familiar with that you just never knew were there before. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit because this whole time it's been under the auspices of home theater. But honestly, one of the coolest things that came out of my home theater was not watching movies, but I'll save that, uh, that little tidbit for later. Um, and, 
what you end up with is okay. I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna make an investment decision long term that I'm gonna I'm gonna buy what I call introductory high end. Right. R one of the rules I've learned early on in home theaters that's a bottomless pit. You can spend as much or as little money as you want. So I don't really like having conversations about what's right for someone else to spend because you know your finances best. Uh, but what I can say is if you uh, want to budget and invest in the long term for high end introductory, you just can't go long. You can't go wrong with ELOC. You really can't. Um, so this was a simple order online. You can get them through Amazon, et cetera. They'll ship straight to the house. Um, similarly with the TV, like I highly recommend instead of like trying to get it in your pickup and then have the screen get cracked or whatever, just have Costco deliver it to the house, free shipping. They'll place it in a room of your choice. You'll sleep easy. It'll be an easy unboxing experience. You don't have to worry about damage. Um, with all of this, trying to get it shipped to the house, I think is a much better experience by and large than the risk you take when you're driving it from the store to your home. So weird thing to keep in mind, but something I was really happy with, with how that worked out. Uh, because for my first television, I didn't do that. Um, and for an apartment, I had to go up three, up three flights of garden stairs. And that was a, a spiritual experience. So uh, highly recommend delivery if you can um, negotiate that. Yeah. Here in the U S if you're buying from Amazon, they're, they're just going to drop it there for you and you can get, you know, they'll bring it in. They'll even, I think in some cases with TVs, they even offer to bring it in for you. They won't, you could probably buy setup if you wanted to, but you're going to do your own. So you really just want them to get it there in one place. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you pick a speaker system. In my case, it's ELOC. Uh, I'll be able to tell you with r really cool data why it was a great choice. Um, so now I have my speaker system. I have my uh, TV panel, um, and that's pretty much all I have at this point. What's next? Um, well, I know that I need these two things to talk to each other, and I know that I need to power the speakers. So now I know, based off of the ELOX power requirements, that the front front facing speakers require uh, at most, I think, 120 or 150 watts. Um, it's all in the manual. Um, and based on that, I can now go shopping for my AVRs. And the first thing I'm looking for is a receiver that can meet the power requirements for my speakers. And what you'll see with a lot of these receivers is kind of reading the fine print. So unlike a dedicated amp with pre-outs where it will, it will guarantee power to each speaker at a rated amount of wattage. The receivers are read the fide print. They're called, most of them are what's called two channel driven, meaning they'll give you that power wattage output rating at up to two channels at any time. So this theoretically means that if you're in this crazy scene where every speaker at once says, give me the max juice and you got the volume on at a hundred, you might not get that full sound because it's two channel driven. In practice, I have yet to see why I would really need a dedicated amp for these speakers. Um, the receiver I picked in part because it, I believe that it would, it's a correctly specced AVR, two channel driven for what I got, that if you do that correctly, um, yeah, feel free to get the, um, the amp if that's what uh, excites you. Um, I may still do it just so I can do a very vanilla uh, AB test comparison between the two and update on that. Um, and you'll see in the higher end AVR models, again, not all AVR support the ability to have a separate dedicated amp that then pre outs to the AVR. So that's something you have to look out for. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that power efficiency is always going to be much better if you buy a dedicated amp as opposed to doing it through an AVR. With the all in one solution of the AVR, the transformer is like a D rated uh, transformer. Whereas a dedicated amp is a A slash B grade uh, rating. So just like uh, power supplies and in, in computers have different power efficiencies and ratings, similar deal there. Um, you'll notice a fair amount of heat will come off an AVR because of that, that power output. And so you'll want it to be well ventilated at the very least. If not, if it's in a cabinet, you may need to put some fans or other type of cooling. Um, but 
you know, maybe there's this argument to me made that if you have a dedicated amp, not as much heat's going to come out of that AVR. And if you buy a higher end AVR, it's going to last longer. Um, uh, you can read all sorts of things for and against those views. And I, I will try to avoid those, those battles for the moment, but to keep it simple, those are your two options. I recommend if you're in that introductory home theater range, you don't really worry. You, you get an AVR that can support the dedicated amp because that puts you in a certain range of quality but you don't need to worry about going straight to the dedicated amp. So you're looking for an AVR. Now, just like with speakers where there's a lot of really well-known brands, you're going to find the same thing with receivers. There's Yamahas, there's Pioneers, there's Denons, um, and I, I, there's Sonys, right? So a uh, ton of different stuff. Um, once you know what your speaker system is and what your panel system is, feel free to cheat by going around Google and seeing what other people have bought for the AVRs to mix and match. Um, but uh, in my case, again, I'm going to give you a recommendation worth the price you paid for it, which was none, which was um, Denon has been a household name in the space for, for years, high quality products. Um, and they have a lot of different, what I really like about Denon is that their product line is really, gearing towards every single tier from kind of true beginner minimal setup to advanced. So you can spend as little as $400 on an AVR with Denon and as much as $5,000. Uh, and some of them are even crazier. I think, uh, I think the most expensive Denon I've seen is like 13,000. And that's like, if you have multiple rooms in a mansion with 20 speakers and you have different zones you want to set up and you want to make sure that when Captain Kirk beams in your house, the speaker system starts playing, you go and you buy one of those spaceships. Um, but for the introductory kind of high end home theater experience, you're going to be probably paying anywhere on the low end. Again, the factor in U S inflation that we've seen this year in technology, you're going to be paying anywhere on the, on the minimal end from about 1200, and to the higher end, I would say not worth going above 2000 unless you really know something special you're doing. Um, and so the AVR I landed on is the one Jim has right here, the AVR X37H. Um, and I'll explain why. So the first thing you note is that it can deliver 105 watts of power over nine channels. Again, it's two channel driven, but like this means I'm going to meet my power requirements very easily. Um, the second thing is, and this one is really was important to me as a, it was a distinguisher for me in terms of what AVR, what was the minimum AVR I had to go to, to get the feature I wanted. And one of the features I wanted was to be able to do, um, 120 Hertz 4k displays, which are native on these LG OLED panels. And so if you want to be able to pass through other video content through your Denon, you're going to want one that supports. 4k at 120 hertz so you can have a receiver that supports 4k but the older ones and or the lower end ones will support at 60 hertz not 120 hertz so for better high dynamic range content you really want the 120 hertz the other thing i will caveat this with is that um, your best viewing experience is when everything is either pass through meaning your receiver or your all your other things aren't adding their own spin on how to decode and interpret the audio or the video signal um, but more importantly um, you'll get you kind of your best experience just you know if you're natively opening the Netflix app on that television like it's going to be the best interpretation right so the other thing to observe as minimum criteria though is the codecs that are supported, right? So here you can see right in the advertisement that it supports the Dolby Atmos, the Odyssey X setup for autom automated calibration of the speaker system. And again, people might get misled by this 8K. Oh, I have no 8K, 8K content. I'm never going to watch it. And for me, you're absolutely right. Uh, I didn't buy it though for 8K. I bought it because it supports 4K at 120 hertz. And by and large, what you will find on the market right now is there's really not many receivers that support 4K 120 hertz, but not 8K at 60 hertz. Um, so you're going to be looking at receivers that support that 8K at 60 hertz standard and then making sure that they support 4K at 120 hertz. This model is a little bit older, right? Again, talking about that kind of one year back. So when you 
look at the 2020 model here, when this first came out, they had a little bit of a firmware problem where they couldn't get 4K at 120 hertz without shipping you a free module because they, they goofed more or less. Now with any new serial numbers, you go and buy this today, it's just, it's automatically working, it's correct and it's all good. Um, and then for me, I mean, this, this kind of really fit the bill. Like I don't have 11.2 channels, it's 5.1.2. So I have seven things I need to power, not 11. Um, so I'm, I'm matched well on the power. It's gonna meet the video specs that I need in terms of the 120 Hertz pass through. Um, I, I, I have the option to go to a dedicated amp if I want to, but I don't, you know, I'm not being forced to. It like the LG has all these built-in features with the Spotify and the AirPlay and the Pandora and the Heos app and like any integration you can imagine. This thing is a very network device. It's kind of like a computer unto itself. Um, and then the last feature, which I think a lot of people who are new to home theater just don't know what it means until they know is this spec called HDMI uh, eARC or ARC, um, which is a mechanism for you have one HDMI cable between your receiver and your television. And that one cable passes a whole bunch of content. It can pass internet frames. It can pass um, uh, video. It can pass audio. Um, and it can pass remote control signals. So with this AVR, my remote worked with anything I plugged into the AVR. The audio natively passes through from the LG out to the speaker system and vice versa. I can select content coming off the receiver back to the television. Um, and it's a simple, now you need specifically HDMI 2.1 is the spec and there's a specific cable. So HDMI has gone through 1.0, 1.4, 1.4, 2.0. Oh, now we're on 2.1, which is up to 48, gig 48 gigabits per second of bandwidth over that cable and over that spec. And that's what allows all these different things to support. Um, but at the end of the day, you get one channel uh, or excuse me, one cable that integrates everything, the audio, the video, the remote control, et cetera. And there's very little setup involved because now you have a smart computer talking to another smart computer, which is your television, and they're passing back and forth the data that they need to just automatically do setup. Um, you don't have pretty much anything to worry about. It's a very easy setup at that point um, to basically go from eARC on your LG OLED to eARC on your Denon AVR. Your speakers are powered, high quality sound, um, and, and, and pretty awesome. Um, I also want to call out um, in the channel, because I see some of the discussion around eARC and and passing through audio. One of the big uh, lessons learned is not only do you want to take advantage of this uh, if you can, but the settings on the television really matter here. By default, most televisions, including the LG, will set the audio output uh, to auto or PCM which you can just think of as a kind of standardized format in which it pushes out the output encoding. And you really don't want that. You want to turn all that off and go to pass through or bypass, which puts the audio data natively to the Denon, which allows the Denon um, to interpret the audio, specifically the Dolby Atmos, and then render it and send it out to your speakers. Um, I noticed an incredible difference with turning that one setting off. Um, and it's like, there's 50 settings when you get this thing. It's like the crazy thing about it is like after you make all these hard choices about what to buy and you plug it in for the first time, uh, there are still some more settings to get right. That's like one of the critical ones is like make sure if you're a real enthusiast and you want to have maximum control, make sure everything is set to pass through or bypass. Make sure all the fancy equalizer, audio adjustment, correction stuff is turned off. Turn off all the AI sound stuff. Like if, if someone's, you know, if there's a setting that says it's trying to correct something on your behalf, just kill it. Um, and that, and then, then you can one at a time enable or disable and see, you know, compare, does it sound better? Does it sound worse for you in the room? Um, but one of the brilliant things about the AVR is that 
with with the higher end solutions like the Denon, it comes with um, a, an Odyssey setup. So you plug in a setup microphone and it shoots out space laser audio sounds out of each speaker. And what it's really doing is it's measuring exactly uh, the acoustic distance and what it sent out and what it heard coming back. Um, and so it measures how far your speakers are out precisely uh, to a tenth of an inch um, across um, uh, across your sound setup, irrespective of what configuration you have. And it'll make those initial calibration adjustments for power and distance that you definitely kind of want to do the setup for. That is the one thing you want a computer to get right for you on your behalf. But it's really important that you place your audio correctly. And what I mean by that is that just like there's a correct viewing angle and distance of, you know, seven to nine feet, um, you need to place your audio correctly. You need to really do your measurements, make sure that your speakers have at least two feet of space around them when appropriate for front standing, uh, making sure that you know, you're measuring your angles and your direction of sound and that all your speakers are kind of aligned to what I call the best seat in the house, which is that center seat in the room. Um, and that will allow for this great calibration experience. Um, and really kind of once you get that get through those initial set of decisions, there's all sorts of, you know, other smaller stuff you're going to have to figure out, right? So like, if you go back to the speaker discussion, well, how did those speakers ever get hooked up to the AVR? Well, you go and you buy wire and it's like, there's a ton of wire and they're all at different gauges and like, what kind of gauge do I want? And what does that even mean? Um, by and large, it all goes back to uh, what's your power requirement at what level of resistance and then what's your receiver? Um, the lower the uh, gauge of the wire is, the thicker it is, and the um, the like higher quality it is in some respects, and the less you're going to have to worry about things like, oh, my house caught on fire because I used this thin speaker wire and it just didn't quite work out for me. Yeah, um, but it, you also have to take in mind, you know, it, the thicker it gets, the harder it gets to work. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. So for me, the sweet spot was like, You'll see like Best Buy and a bunch of other places will try and convince you to go with a uh, 16 uh, gauge, which to me is a little bit too low for this. Um, I would say if you really want high, high end, you go with 12. I ended up with 14. For me, that was a sweet spot. I could get 200 foot spool of 14 gauge at Home Depot for hundred bucks and I could cut my own custom lengths and shape it exactly the way I want it and crimp it and the whole nine yards. And then on top of that, uh, do yourself a favor and get these things called banana plugs, which basically uh, ensure really good, strong metal contact between your speaker wire and the it, the port it's going into. And it, it makes it much more like plugging in and out a three and a half millimeter audio jack, in essence, uh, makes it easier to work with, make sure you have good contacts. Um, so you can go to Crutchfield when in doubt with home theater, go to Crutchfield and start searching things. Um, but Crutchfield sells a nice pack of speaker plugs. You can also get them um, at Amazon. You can get them overnight prime in the US. Um, so there's also kind of a multitude of different speaker plugs. Don't overthink it. Hit add to cart and move on with that. Um, but yeah, it's one of those like smaller detail things that can uh, kind of matter. Yeah. If you think of uh, 14, most US houses wired, they're light for lighting kind of general switches and stuff on 14 for heavier duty, you're going to go 12, right? So that just as you're thinking about that uh, kind of from a size uh, perspective and, and I think speaker wiring has come a long way from the old, you know, if you think about 20 years ago and some of just the, just some of the crap they had now coppers in short supply. <laughs> so right now everything is expensive. Uh, when it comes to the wiring, you, I went to Menards, you know, our, our big, our big box store that's close and they have an apology sign in the wiring area. It says, we're sorry, like copper's expensive. This stuff is just costing a lot. So it, it's, it is one of those, I think from a speaker configuration setup, as you're thinking kind of about this in the size of your room, you may make, that may be one of those budget items you need to make sure you're accounting for which is getting all that wiring in place because it used to be fairly negligible from a cost standpoint. Today, it could be a little bit more than it was in the past. So just kind of um, something to think about. Um, Christian, 
uh, Ken had asked a question about 8K and, you know, we're not talking about 16K yet or whatever the next thing is yeah. that, that pops yeah. in here. But with things moving as quick as we moved, I mean, hey, I was at your place when you had gotten that that 4K and we were like, this is the best thing in the world, right? And now you're like, well, yeah. I mean, OLED, yeah, okay. So as you look ahead, any, and there's always concerns on this, but your thoughts on future proofing? Do you, how, do you, how, what do you, with that TV, what do you think you get? Is it three, five, seven from number of years, like before you start thinking? And is it plug and play? Do you feel like that TV is going to be plug and play with the next one? Or no, let me, I'm sorry, that the sound setup is going to be plug and play with the next TV so that you, when you, when you do replace that with something else, whatever the five years from now, whatever the fancy thing is, you can just plug it right back in. Thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, interoperability is only getting better in the home theater space. So i I feel highly confident in saying that, you know, your AVR of today is going to have no problem connecting to a TV five years from now. It may not have whatever the crazy new latest whistle bell features that comes out, but like, it's going to work with the features you have today. If what you're trying to upgrade is the visual experience while maintaining the audio experience you have. Um, on future proofing on video, I really think most consumers are going to, you know, enthusiast consumers are going to be happy with, I buy a new television, I look at it for five years, and then I'm thinking about an upgrade. Um, to that extent, um, the 4K versus 8K conversation is kind of interesting. You can go buy an 8K today. But if you buy it in OLED, you're going to pay way more than if you buy it in LED. And if I had to choose 8K LED or QLED, which is kind of this middle ground compromise that the industry has come up with, if I had to choose between an 8K QLED or a 4K 120 hertz OLED, hands down every time I choose the 4K OLED. Um, also, you just don't have anyone pushing out 8K content yet now. You're all sitting there, but this is what we were talking about when it was 1080p. Damn it, yeah. 4K was there, right? You know, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I just, uh, you can go listen a few shows back at Home Gadget Geeks when I talk about the convergence of consumer internet just getting super exciting. I think the infrastructure is going to be there to stream 8K if we want to do it. No problem. Um, not clear when the content providers switch to starting to do that. Um, I don't feel like I'm missing out. Um, so for me, I'm more future proofing around some of the other features, particularly around the, the, the formats, the Dolby, the IMAX enhanced, et cetera. I'm not as focused on, is it 4k or is it 8k? So from that extent, I don't think you need to, if you're thinking that five year range, I think it's, it's totally like flip a flip a coin as to whether or not 8k is mainstream in five years. And if it is great, you're going to buy a new television anyway. Um, and, and this AVR that we just talked about already supports the 8k. So you're good to go there too. Right. So you're already future proofed in some of those other components. And now we're really just talking about like, when are they going to flip that bit? Um, but, um, you know, I think every person's going to have their preference, but for me, I really preference on the color profile, the content that's coming down and getting as much as possible towards lossless quality over streaming. Like obviously the best experience is going to be if you have the original Blu-ray or the original CD playing it locally, but uh, as streaming and internet gets better, like you're, you're not going to feel like you're missing out is my take. And, mm -hmm. and five years from now, when you're ready to upgrade, you're, you're going to be ready to go. Uh, in the, uh, the new internet service you talked me into uh, this morning, I was doing some testing. Now I test this thing every day. It's just crazy. I was getting 500 down and a hundred up. And I was like, <laughs> what, what, what happened? Like what, why all of a sudden today is it so good? <laughs> you know, it made me want to stream some, it just want to make, you know, made me want to stream everything. I do think, you know, and that's, I mean, that's just 5g and that's only going to get better. So I, I think, yeah, I think you're right from that from that standpoint. What about so is lighting a consider uh, consideration in, in this? Uh, we oftentimes think about the hardware and the sound, but certainly as you're watching this, you want to create the optimum kind of lighting situation there. Did you did you think through that? Did you did you build kind of a custom lighting plan for it as well? 
Yeah, um, I thought about it a fair amount um, when I first when I first thought about it. I said, hmm, maybe I'm going. So it's a it's a it's a like a, a finished drop in ceiling. So you can think of office ceiling style drop in ceiling. But early on when I bought the house, I, I redid that. I took all the, you know, the thick office tile that kind of has the foam. Mm -hmm. That's like a recipe for mold and it just kind of doesn't look very appealing. So mm -hmm. I switched to paper thin vinyl based tiles that are mold resistant and just make the room pop. They're very reflective. So it's really cool, but basically I have a drop in ceiling to work with. So my options were and again, keep in mind, like uh, paper thin, you got to kind of be careful when you measure and do some cutouts. And then on top of that, um, you have maybe soundproofing you want to do above that drop in ceiling. And then you also have um, if you're going to add lighting receptacles, like that's a fair investment, because what I have right now is the two feet by four feet, like light panel drop ins, which are old school fluorescent light bulbs with ballasts. And so I was like, hmm. Is there a middle ground that doesn't involve me building a bunch of new lighting, but still gives me what I want? And what I ended up doing uh, was kind of cool. So um, I converted the uh, fluorescent lighting to which we're using T12 bulbs to LEDs, uh, dimmable LED bulbs. And then I installed a Lutron switch, which has a remote control, an IR remote control. And so when you come down in the basement, you turn on the light switch, you walk over the home theater, you sit down in the home theater, and then you have a remote control to, to turn the lights on and off or at a dim setting because it supports like, you know, six different dimming profiles. And the room is as like as light or as dim as I need it with one fixture. So I really didn't need the six different circles idea that I had in my head. Certainly aesthetically would have looked nice, um, but in terms of the actual lighting quality, wasn't a big deal. And I really cared about... Um, once I sat down, I didn't want to get back up. I wanted to be able to dim. I wanted to be able to be bright. Uh, and so that was a really cheap solution to just kind of retrofit that lighting and move forward. You can go to Home Depot and pick up for 20 bucks the kit that converts you from fluorescent bulbs to LED bulbs. Are um, you changing the ballast on that? Or is it... Is you it completely remove them. Just the light. Okay, so you take those out. But you're not removing the lighting, the fixture itself. You're just Cor replace, replacing yeah, the so inner. You basically the cut the electrical wiring that goes to the ballast. You can choose to remove them or not, but you cut the wiring. And then based on whether you have shunted or non-shunted ends, the thing about LED fluorescent bulbs is that they're only powered on one end, whereas with a fluorescent bulb, they get power on both ends. So as long as you have um, like non-shunted ends uh, and that you're going to, the LED is one-sided power. Uh, you should be able to do fairly minimal rewiring. Um, long story short, I ended up making it more complicated for myself than I did. And I ended up replacing all the shunts, all the wiring and just starting from scratch. Uh, but you don't have to take the fixture out. You can do it in the wall. It's, it's a fairly easy maintenance activity most of the time. And it's way more power efficient and way less noisier and all that good stuff. Um, and for... Um, you know, the whole Alexa question, um, I thought long and hard about, do I want another thing in my house that does the voice control? Um, uh, certainly my dad went this route. So the light switch, the lighting, the TV, everything talks to Alexa and it works really well. Um, I decided I wanted a, uh, a audio list set up this time. <laughs> so I went for physical remotes and just as... I have one remote that controls it all from a home theater experience perspective. And then I have the one Lutron switch for the lighting and you know, that's fine for me. I think remotes are better. I really do. For, we, listen, we we've got, we've got the a lady in the kitchen and we play music through it and it gets, it only gets it right half the time. Just tonight I was trying to get it to play a song and it wanted to play the live version. No, no, no. I don't want that one. So I kind of had to trick it by doing the playlist for the band. And then shuffle through the songs till I got the song that I wanted. And I was like, this would have been so much easier just on my phone, which or a remote, right? Uh, so I can't imagine the value. And listen, some of you are yelling at me right now as I'm saying these kinds of things. But for a home theater experience, I still don't get the value of the, the, the assistant. Yeah, yeah, you can do some things. Hey, bring this up or bring that up or start the Xbox or get Plex or whatever. Okay, I get that. But for the fine-tuning stuff, I don't know. I, it's just 
to me, it it's, I think we're still a ways away from that. And I just find the remote. I do find the remote a little bit easier. Yeah. yeah. That's right my, on. Just my preference. I know a lot of people, they get a lot of remotes and then eventually they, you know, they're like, huh, can't we, can't we get this down? You know, I hear Richard all the time, Richard Gunther, uh, kind of talking about this all the time and, you know, trying to get down to one remote and harmony remote and program, you know, programming it. Is this, um, uh, Christian, I'm showing it on screen. Is this kind of what you're talking about as far as replacing the, the actual fluorescent lights with, in this case, it's a. Yep. That's a exactly what I used. Actually, the toggled kit is super easy. I choose 4,000 Kelvin for my color. Um, and yeah, my, my panel is four of those tubes for one of the, uh, um, fixtures and that was it. I'm like two for two on guessing. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of creepy actually. <laughs> Thank you. We have no show notes tonight. Like Christian gave me no outline. We're just kind of winging this whole thing. And just the last two things I found that you were talking about were already on the screen when we went there. So I have, I, so by the way, I'm, you know, uh, I've got this problem. I'm replacing the ceilings in down here in the basement. We've got a room that, that they're just, they just need, you know, I've got the old office style. I want the whole thing gone. So I'm going to, I'm going to rip it all out, but I've got this style of lighting. And I was kind of wondering if I were to do this differently, you know, down here, in the utility area, I just bought new fixtures that were, were LED fixtures. Pretty inexpensive, not tunable. I like the color out of the box. Hang it up, plug it in. It was great, right? It's $17 maybe to get a to get a light replacement. But I think for some where they want to change these out, and it is kind of a pain to go back through and pull you know, pull the wiring or re get it rewired or put a new fixture in. I think this could be a good replacement. And at 20 bucks, that's, that's pretty, um, that's pretty cost effective. Yeah. No, right on. Um, couldn't, couldn't agree more. I mean, it was a, it was an easy sell, um, for me yeah. uh, and it, yeah. it saved a fair amount of work. Right. And I still yeah. got the effect that I wanted from a lighting perspective. So I was really happy with that project. Yeah. A couple, um, I, I mentioned the, uh, I mentioned the beloved harmony, and, uh, you know, John's a big fan and Alex is saying they'll have to pry mine away from me. I've been hearing a little bit on Entertainment 2.0. I hear those guys talk about that all the time. And I'm like, you know, if I got to program my remote, <laughs> you know, I, I know you guys enjoy that. I just, that's, that's because, yeah, no, it wouldn't work here. It wouldn't work with Dawson <laughs> else. That's not going to work here. So, yeah. But by far the best part of this whole thing had uh yeah andrew uh wife acceptance factor is a big measurement that you do at the end of home theater uh if you're married this is something that is absolutely required uh, to go into the calculus and wife acceptance factor was a 10 out of 10 when we opened up our planets on netflix and it gets to the the big uh milky way galaxy scene and the sound and the crispy it was it was winning so uh we we definitely uh hit the right sweet spot there uh, and there was certainly some skepticism along the way getting to that point no doubt like do we really need that and are we really going to home depot again and are you sure but yeah it worked out Oh, that's good. So, I can hear her saying that, by the way. Yeah. I can hear her saying that. Um, Christian, do we yeah. do we really have we gone a little too far here? Have we you know? jumped off the deep end yet? She's, yeah. she's pretty she's pretty kind to you, but but yeah. uh but I can hear her kind of saying saying that. So from an install perspective, is everything in? Do you got it? Is it a hundred percent done? Are you gonna keep tinkering with it? Give us the what's the post show on that? Yeah, so I'm at the point where we are, quote, operational, but still with temporary furniture. So the actual final furniture comes in like four to five weeks. And with that, I will do final adjustments. I will build, I'm probably going to build small speaker podiums that sit on top of these tables for the rear end to make sure it matches the final ear height of the, um, the, the, the whole listening calculus that I've done. Um, and then I also have some cleanup to do on wiring. I'm a huge wiring cable fanatic. So um, I still have some wall outlets and brush plates and cabling that I want to get right. So some of that is still kind of in a holding pattern, but it's a, 
it is a usable home theater experience right now. We've had a ton of fun with it. I was afraid at one point I was going to have to start selling admission tickets when every <laughs> every week I had a friend calling me up saying, "Hey, can we watch Dune this weekend?" And oh. you know, this was my first movie demo content in yeah. Dolby Vision and Atmos. And no, it's been a treat. But honestly, the coolest thing about it, and it's going to sound sickening, is that uh, the coolest part has nothing to do with the visuals. Um, the thing that has just totally captivated me with this whole thing um, was a quest I went on, which was how do I listen to ALAC lossless audio in uh, Dolby Atmos spatial sound, which is a standard that is exclusively uh, between Apple Music and Dolby. Apple Music's like the only mainstream thing out there that streams ALAC in the 192 kilohertz with so better than CD quality sound and does the spatial audio, which is unlike anything you have ever heard. Like you think you've heard Elton John Rocket Man on someone's sound system, but it's nothing like hearing it in spatial audio. Like the music truly comes alive in a way that you just never you never knew quite what was in there mm -hmm. it's like sitting in a concert of one where they're there and and, and just it's unbelievable mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. the apple tv 4k i use for nothing else except for this music uh fantasy of mine because um i don't need it for apple tv plus or for watching video content it's also only 60 hertz uh, out on the gen 4 so again like i exclusively use it because it's the only apple device AirPlay won't quite do it. MacBook Pros won't quite do it. You can get lossless, but you can't get spatial. But my goodness, what a treat it is when you get Apple TV 4K playing spatial audio. And they have uh, you know, tens of thousands of these tracks now in Apple that you can stream, both classics that have been remastered as well as new ones being recorded in the spatial audio Atmos spec. And wow, um, I thought I had heard music um, and then I heard spatial audio. Um, so that is, uh, awesome. And, you know, to Andrew's point, like, where do I find the audio files? Like that's, that's like one of the beauties of it is like, I don't have to find the audio files. I say, I go to the Apple, I go to my Apple remote or my LG remote and say the name of the title. And if it's in at most content, uh, we're good to go. Uh, Apple has created these curated playlists of spatial audio where, mixed genres, single genres, etc. And I was just so blown. It wasn't like, oh, here's the one demo CD that does this. Like, no, they're pushing not only a huge portion of their library in lossless, but they got a huge amount of content now in this spatial audio. And, you know, the only other way you can kind of listen to it on the, on the um, portable aspect is like, if you have an iPhone or equivalent with AirPod Pros, you can put the AirPod Pros into like a spatial audio mode and you'll get a sense, but it's just not the same thing mm -hmm. is when spatial audio is coming out through Atmos quality and lossless content over speakers with the quality E-Lock. It just, man, it, it, movies are great. The panel is amazing. 10 out of 10, but <laughs> oh my gosh, it was like a 12 out of 10 when I stumbled on spatial audio. Well, Christian, as a musician, you know, and you've played in some nice places uh, in the past. And so you really, I think you really hear and appreciate that m maybe more than anybody else. And, uh, and you know, you just, you understand that spatialness because you've been in symphonies where all that is playing around you. Right? I mean, in some sense, absolutely. But I, I can't, I can't tell you how many average guy listeners who have come over who aren't musicians yeah, who yeah, yeah. just kind of do the iPad thing with earbuds and they're like, holy cow, I didn't know it sounded like that. Um, you know, and you're listening to Rocket Man and some of the sound starts on the left side of the room and works its way 3D around to the right. And then just these objects are popping out and it, it's it's really something special. Um uh, it is the highlight of of the home theater, yeah. and it has nothing yeah. to do with watching stuff. Yeah. So, cool. no, not 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 trying to say it's not for the average guy, because I think it is. But I think yeah. you you uniquely, I mean, you you listen because of your music background. You listen for it. And I think you just really, um, you know, you just really appreciate it, um, uh, kind of when you hear it, right? From that, yeah, from that perspective. 
Um, I was going to say one other thing on spatial audio. Shoot, I had a question for you. Um, darn, they distracted me in the they distracted me in the chat room, and I lost it already. Darn it. Well, maybe it'll come back here in a second. Christian, anything else we've we've kind of you know we spent the last hour and some change talking about anything else you'd add from uh, or or that we didn't cover? No, I think that's a wrap. Uh, that kind of gets me through my uh, home theater build to date so far, and uh, I'll provide a little updates here and there as I do some of those touching finishes. But yeah. Um, yeah. it's every there's a the great the cool thing about it is it it can be a never ending project. You can do as much or as little as you want with it and you can spend as much or as little as you want with it. So there's something for everyone yeah. there. Yeah. I remember what I was going to say, you know, I've been around a while and I remember, you know, when we think about analog sound, we probably reached the pinnacle uh, for the mainstream uh, back in the late seventies, early eighties. And then uh, Walkman's came around and kind of smashed the whole idea of hi-fi, right? I mean, it just stopped being a thing for the longest time. We could put these things in our ears. They sounded good enough. Like a lot of people are like, this is amazing, right? And I can take it with me. And we never have really come back to hi-fi until till now. And I'm, now doesn't mean like today, but, you know, maybe in the last, you know, four or five years as we've really gotten good sound, good yeah, really, really, really good sound and way better than it ever was on probably on the analog side now for what we can do from what all speakers we have. But there's kind of been a resurgence of this, what we as kids would call hi-fi yeah. right, in that space. And um, it's pretty amazing. I I'll have to admit, um, I'm a little lost in it still. <laughs> you know, you're going through these, the 5.1.4 and, you know, kind of like, yeah, I mean, I know that's there. <laughs> It's one of those things though. It's where it's like when you really just let it sink in and do a little bit of reading and take that leap. Uh, cool things are ahead. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, John just woke me out of my amnesia, which is once you get your audio calibrated. Um, we specifically got together to to have this experience so I could talk about it on the show tonight and in the after report, which is. Um, I mentioned earlier that these TVs are basically computers unto themselves, right? And so they're uh, remarkably LG and many of the other vendors now support baked right into the TV, um, the ability to uh, play the test pattern files directly to the TV. Well, what's a test pattern file? It, it basically has every range of black to white. It has the colors and um, uh you essentially there's this product that John and I used called Calman, which has kind of a photo electric sensor that goes over the front of the television and it's measuring the photons coming off uh, and getting light and color accuracies. And rather than you sitting there with the remote being like, should the contrast be 40 or should it be 85? And well, should it really be in cinema mode or should it be in, um, in uh, natural mode or, or, you know, what have you, um, this gets you to what's called a natural viewport. So you'll notice when you walk into a Best Buy or these other things that they, they juice it up a little bit, right? Some will have more blues than what was really recorded. Some of them will, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll appeal to that, you know, user that kind of likes the, the flash and the pow, Sizzle. um, yeah, sizzle. but maybe it burns your eyes out a little bit. Maybe <laughs> that sizzle. ocean, maybe that ocean's a little bit bluer than it should be. Um, and so if you really want accuracy and quality in what you're watching, you go through now with these televisions, you go through uh, digital calibration. And so it does take a little bit of time, it takes a few hours to go across each profile. There's three different profiles you can tune on an LG C1. You can tune SDR, HDR, and then the Dolby Vision profile. Um, and we got through tuning like one profile. So we got through tuning Dolby Vision, which is the one I use the most often um, on cinema. And it is really a great way um, to get to that natural view. And the cool thing is with these televisions, you know, like uh, on the LG, there's both the cinema mode and the cinema home mode. They're very similar. But if you set up your calibration software to basically target 
and upload the file for the new values to one of the cinema profiles, you can easily switch back between the two to get a sense for like, well, in effect, how did your calibration turn out in comparison to what you were watching before? Mm -hmm. So you pick your favorite title you've watched a few times and you kind of flip back and forth uh, between the calibrated and uncalibrated one. And, you know, with a high quality panel like an LG, we're not talking like, oh my gosh, if I don't get it calibrated, I'm not watching this television. Like they're designed and built to be gorgeous when you unbox them, if you touch nothing. Um, but this is one of those kind of like go the extra mile projects that can give you that, that little bit of edge. Um, and as a wise technologist in the average guy community once said, you know, if you don't get a whole lot of time to watch television during your work week, um, would you, wouldn't you really want it to be just all that much more special in the time that you do get to watch it? Um, so it's just one of those, uh, kind of finishing touches to really get the full life and enjoyment out of the, the viewing screen. Yeah. It is one of those things too. You don't know how bad it is until you've seen it good. Yeah. And then and, you're like, Oh my God, how did I ever, how did I ever look at that? But you don't know. Right. 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 And certainly on um, like the Samsung that I have, um, the calibration would correct much more perceivable error to the eye than something like an LG. Um, also, there's, you know, with those era of televisions, they were probably one of the last ones where the calibration is still manual, right? So like, it's not just going to upload a file over an IP address to your television with the new data file. Like that's, that's crazy that we can do that to be quite honest as a consumer. That's, that's, cool. that's kind of like the last three to four thing, three to four years, uh, capability. Um, but yeah, uh, you can, it, it depends on what type of television you have in terms of what the scope of the net effect of calibration will be for you. But even on high end panels, uh, it's worth, it's worth the time. All right, good. Glad we got that. Glad you didn't forget that. I, I would, yeah, that would be a little bit part disappointing. Of the show. John, yeah. John came down right to to take care of that for you. So it's it's kind of right. nice about living close to him. He, uh, I'd hate to see how out of calibration my current TV, but we don't know. Like, we can find one, out. We can well, fix that. One, I never watch it. Like I, I've watched maybe five hours of TV uh, out there. I just don't. I just don't do it anymore. I just. I, I can't imagine for me, I can't imagine sitting in front of a TV watching it. I want to be having something on and doing something else. That's just the, that's just what I do. Um, but for, for Christian, there is no experience. Like, uh, and I think Alex said this a little bit earlier in the chat. Once you do this, you, you just don't want to go watch another movie again. You're like, why yeah. would I go to the theater? Are you kidding me? Well, yeah. I mean, Alex is just, you know, spot on. Not only that, but I, I tell people, uh, if you want to watch something that's not in Dolby Atmos or Vision, uh, maybe another time. Obviously, I'm kidding. But like, uh, I'm that, I get that excited when I see that badge in the right corner that says the vision is on and the receiver says Atmos. I'm like, OK, good. I'm, I'm getting the investment out of it that I put into it. So, yeah, uh, yeah pretty funny. Good stuff. Christian, you've given me a lot of time over the last month. Thanks for uh, thanks for being on. We'll we'll try and have you back a little more often than than we have, but certainly monthly with Cyber Frontiers. And so, if you haven't subscribed to that, get out there and uh, get subscribed. We'll be dropping those about once a month and uh, trying to keep you up to date on that. That way, it's just a good way for me to keep up to date with you, Christian. That's yeah, just the right best. On. That's the best way to do it. So. Couple reminders on our way out. One, if you haven't uh, and you need to, if you need uh, some kind of hosting plan, Maple Grove Partners out at maplegrovepartners.com. Plans to start as little te as ten dollars a month for some great rock and service, and you kind of know the guy. <laughs> you know the guy that does it. That's pretty nice. Uh, check him out if you need something. He's ready to go. It's, there's some space, right? You got you got some space for a few oh, yeah. very special customers, right? Absolutely. All right. So check it out today. Maple, uh, maplegrovepartners.com. Again, no show next week. We'll move the discord, uh, the post show discord chat. We'll move that to the third. Marv B is back next week. I'll be married. So next week we celebrate 33 years, Christian. Um, it's a long time. Boom. It's a long time. Congratulations. Well done. Up with me that long. Let's just be well really done. clear about that. <laughs> the, 
no, they're yeah. home theater. It'll it'll bring years of joy and entertainment yes. to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nah, she just, that's the last thing she would <laughs> she would not want me to touch that thing. Like, don't, don't, no, don't. You know, she's just now we've got a NVIDIA shield on it. I've got channel set up here working great. Everything's working. Like if I start messing with stuff, she'd be like, Don't, don't, don't be touching that. Like it works, works for me. So it's fine. I'm just going to leave it. That would be the, the best gift would be the gift that I didn't give in that case. So I'll just go get flowers. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central 9 Eastern. I heard the average guy dot TV live, except next week. And uh, well, and there's, there's a few things to do that. Uh, thanks for, for those of you who came out live. We'll do it uh, just a smidge in a post show, not a bunch. I've had Christian a whole bunch over the last couple of weeks. So, but uh, we may do a little bit. Thanks for coming out tonight. With that, we'll say goodbye. Good night.